Thank you. So our next session is on lessons learned, white salmon river riparian restoration efforts above and below the conduit dam removal project. And our two presenters are first Adrian Grimm, who's an hydrologist for the Yakima Nation Fisheries. Adrian is a is a hydro excuse me hydro hydrologist and watershed restoration specialist for the Yakima Nation Fisheries in the Klickitat River Basin and the Southern Territories of Washington State. Adrian focuses on developing, implementing, and monitoring habitat improvement projects, collecting field data, and developing spatial analysis in support of wild steelhead and salmonids in the Mid-Columbia region. Her recent research and focal areas have included functional ecology, stream ecology, and water resource management. Adrian has an MS in water resources science and management and BA degrees in environmental studies and international affairs. Our second presenter is Janet Burkhart. She's a watershed planner for the Yakima Nation Fisheries. Jeanette is, um, has been a watershed planner with the Yakima Nation Fisheries Program in the Tribe Southern Territory since 2005. Jeanette works on local, regional land use and natural resource planning that affects fish and their habitats. She manages and implements habitat projects and conducts education and outreach. Jeanette is part of the WISHPA Working Group, which focuses on retaining or reintegrating beavers and their activities in our local watersheds. Jeanette has a BA from Queen's University and is an unabashed fan of plants. So please go ahead. Adrian, if you're first. Thank you so much, Janet, for that introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yes, my name is Adrian Grimm, and I'm with Yakima Nation Fisheries. Uh, Get ready for some fast talking because we're going to cover two projects today. Uh, first, I'll be sharing information on a project we have completed at the confluence of the White Salmon and the Columbia River. And next, my colleague Jeanette Burkhart, watershed planner in the Southern Ceded Territories, will be discussing a riparian restoration project at the site behind the drained reservoir of the former Condit Dam. Both of these projects seek to restore habitats affected by the breach and removal of Condit Dam in 2011 and 2012, the largest intentional dam removal attempted at that time in the U.S., in a basin that is home to, to several species of ESA-listed salmonids. The mobilization of a century's worth of impounded sediments provide the backdrop and impetus for these two projects. The White Salmon River is located in south central Washington state and flows primarily off the White Salmon Glacier of Mount Adams. The confluence of the White Salmon and Columbia River shown here has been a village and fishing access site for a millennia. And the mouth of the White Salmon River is located approximately 20 miles upstream of the Bonneville Dam and is strongly influenced by dam manipulation to the pool level. Historically, the mouths of tributaries had complex, diverse, vegetated, shallow water habitats with braided channels. You can see at the Hood River and the White Salmon mouths there. This habitat was used by juvenile salmonids and other aquatic species for rearing and resting. It's estimated that about 26% of riparian island and main stem Columbia River side channel habitat has been lost. Uh, these were food-rich areas that allowed juveniles to feed and hide from predators on their downstream migration to the ocean. To talk about some historic conditions, the White Salmon River is named after its most abundant salmon run, the light flesh-colored Thule Fall Chinook, an important fishery that was particularly known and used by tribal people in the late fall to harvest and dry the large-bodied fish for winter food stores. This site at Underwood has significance due to its continuous use for a millennia as a, the Nam Nit village and fishing site. At the transitional zone between eastern and western ecotypes, 
the area around the confluence of the White Salmon River was likely a true convergence and confluence of cultures, languages, and ecosystems. The lower right photo shows the Bureau of Fisheries weirs that were erected to collect brood stock for the Spring Creek Fish Hatchery built in 1901. Despite living adjacent to this area, Indians were prohibited from fishing near the weirs. Uh, though the weir location was likely based on traditional Indian use prior to settlement. In lieu fishing sites, like including Underwood and others along the Columbia, were set aside, often hastily and without infrastructure, by Congress in 1945 as mitigation for inundated villages and other usual and accustomed fishing, hunting, and gathering areas under the Bonneville Pool. Condit Dam was breached with explosives in October of 2011, releasing a portion of the stored up 2.4 million cubic yards of sediment within 15 weeks or so, 60% of the mostly sand, silt, and clay had been eroded, both mechanically as shown in the top right photo with that machinery and naturally. Um, some material deposited at the mouth and inside of the Highway 14 bridge at the Underwood site, completely fishing, filling in what had been the fishing access for, for people at the village. Condit was, as mentioned, the largest intentional dam removal, especially using this blow and go method with explosives, which was designed to transport sediment as quickly as possible. Project goals for this 3.77 acre site, uh, restore access for, treaty, for tribal treaty fisheries and reduce future sedimentation. Inundation of this fishery site was an expected outcome with the Condit Dam removal. However, um, access needed to be reestablished for this important use. Um, Navigational boat access allows tribal members to continue exercising their treaty rights to fish. And because the inlet site is used by all four Columbia River Treaty tribes, consensus to restore navigation had to be made by four tribes. And the Yakima Nation was chosen to lead and manage the project. The primary fund source for the project was Pacific Core Energy as part of the Condit Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement. And a grant from the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund funded restoration work and the Bureau of Indian Affairs funded boat ramp improvements. In the interim period between 2011 and 2017, when the project began, there were fairly low flow conditions in the White Salmon River, uh, which led to vegetation establishment. In 2017, Yakima Nation Fisheries advertised a request for proposals for topo topographic survey, alternatives analysis, hydrologic analyses, designs, and wetland delineation. Uh, the project was awarded to Interflu, located just across the Columbia River. And Interflu conducted water surface elevation and depth modeling to help guide plant species selection. Wells Island in the main stem Columbia was used as a reference reach and a basis for the vegetation prescription. The design centered around utilizing dredged materials from the navigation channel to create riparian island north of the boat ramp. The constructed islands were designed to support diverse native riparian vegetation communities, spanning a range of inundation frequencies. Here are some in-construction photos. Work began the first week of 2018, dredging the navigation channel. No, no material is brought in or out. Um, all of the dredged material was stockpiled, then graded on site. Uh, silt curtains protect the White Salmon River. and um, straw bales were used for temporary erosion control of regraded areas. This is April 2018, nearing the end of the project. Uh, no water conditions are clear. Erosion control fabric and straw bales uh, serve as both an initial medium for planting lag stakes as well as an erosion control feature since they're resistant to scouring in future high flows. Stream bed cobbles function more like natural banks on the left there during pool elevation changes at the Bonneville Dam and provide juvenile habitat instead of riprap or other material. 
increasing the quantity and quality of channel margin habitat for salmonids uh, for rearing and feeding uh, was a big priority for the project. Plant installation occurred in April of 2018 and seeding occurred the last week of April. There were two planting zones, a more upland zone that comprised the majority of the island area, zone three, and then narrow channel margins called zone two along the edges and in a wetland in, in the southwest corner of the project area. Plants selected for both zones would be tolerant of at least occasional wet feet and the area was seeded with native wetland seed mix, spike rushes, rushes such as as soon as construction was complete. Planting methods covered the gamut and included containerized, bare root, live stakes, and, and seed. A PVC irrigation system was installed with a pump and an overhead sprinkler in April of 2018. Starting in early May, the area experienced exceptionally high flows, 140% of normal, uh, due to heavy snowpack in the Columbia River headwaters and very warm temperatures throughout the region, plus rain, um, resulted in extremely high runoff in this area. You can see the entire project site is inundated. And you, those, those slight lines are the irrigation system. The project area was inundated for for the better part of five weeks. However, um, and presumably the seed mix that had been established washed away. We were very concerned about impacts to planted species. Um, however, as Reed mentioned, new seeds washed in during this timing. Uh, some plantings we know did not survive the prolonged inundation. So we were a little concerned. Observations after high water, we observed quite a bit of natural regeneration after the water dropped off. Some areas had plenty of growth, but some needed supplemental planning. We worked with Yakima Nation staff and local groups, including the Mount Adams Institute uh, crews, as well as Washington Youth Conservation Corps crews to replant the area. Uh, primarily using live stakes to replant in the fall and winter and subsequent spring 2018 through 2019. Not only did the seed mix likely wash away, but a lot of unexpected seeds washed in, and we want, were evaluating and monitoring the new growth. We observed plentiful western goldenrod, um, really blanketing the entire project area. We were concerned early on about how pervasive this goldenrod was. Um, luckily, we determined it was a native and eventually provided some unexpected benefits. We removed the irrigation system in June of 2019. You can see here and in the previous picture. The irrigation did work over the first summer after inundation, but it started to break down due to logs rafting into the area during high water. And the PVC was exposed to sunlight. Um, and one burst pipe or, or a couple burst pipes would mean that much of the connected system didn't function. Since the water table can be artificially high in the summer due to manipulations with the Bonneville Dam, summer mortality has not been a major concern. But removal was a very big job. A little bit of a monitoring overview for the project site here. Uh, to document plant growth and site coverage, we did both ground monitoring and aerial monitoring, and 10 photo monitoring sites were established in June of 2019. Photo monitoring points were mounted with T-posts to facilitate relocation and consistency with bright orange as, as vegetation grows up around the project site. Um, to capture inter and intra-annual changes in vegetation, photos are collected at least every season from early spring and fall. Yakima Nation staff um, include a FAA certified uh, pilot to conduct periodic aerial surveys with small unmanned aircraft, small UAVs. Flights are timed to document changing site conditions and seasonal variation. To the extent feasible, consistent perspectives are used so we can compare here over time. Survival monitoring was conducted in the fall of 2019. 
uh, Yakima Nation staff sampled the project site using 15 randomly generated vegetation plots and ARC. Uh, plots were circular with an internal diameter of 30 feet. Um, or seven, about 700 square feet each. Within the plot, survival percentage was generated to determine the degree of mortality that occurred after the initial planting, and then supplemental plantings and natural colonization were tabulated. In addition to replanting, um, invasive species treatments have been ongoing with the assistance of Skamania County, as well as the crews and staff mentioned previously. Uh, Mount Adams and Youth Conservation Corps through the Department of Ecology. We're finding that the abundant goldenrod is providing actually a net benefit. Um, goldenrod has quite a thick growth pattern here shown in the white bar. It's everywhere. Um, but we, we've observed that it's displacing other potential weeds and it really is taking up the majority of the space. Um, weeds at the site could have been much worse after the seed mix was washed away, and um, we were expecting that survival would be negative, negatively impacted by inundation. In, in some places it was, but not nearly as bad as we were expecting. Uh, there are numerous, numerous benefits of the goldenrod, including prolific pollinator habitat, and we think it's been able to hide the woody species early on to protect them from herbivory, which is observed here. Um, recently, we've seen woody species catapult past the maximum height of the goldenrod, having been protected early on. So time will tell. So here's post-construction pictures. Um, we've observed quite a bit of wildlife use, including beaver, who have deepened some channels to promote foraging and expanding their territory where they can travel safely. Um, geese, ducks, birds, deer, browse is evident as shown here uh, woody, on woody species. And juvenile fish have been observed in the navigation channel, and we hope their use of the area will, will only expand in the future. There's a little bit of golden run. Some lesson learned. Uh, even though this was a careful plan, well executed, things can go a, a little off kilter. Uh, inundation for five weeks hasn't happened in this area in recent memory. Um, and just after planting, we were very concerned. Um, a little bit of non-desirable plants got mixed in just, just on accident, so that was a little bit of a bummer, but we re uh, remediated that. And then we were really concerned about what we were going to see after that inundation, but so far, so good. And in general, this is a very visible project site, so consistent and repeated presentations to community and press releases were completed, and still we received a lot of questions and just know there was a lot of discussion in the community. So one last view of the project site, and with that, let's move upstream to hear about the project above the former Condit Dam site. Thank you, Adrienne. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Anybody? I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, great. I uh, just wanted to throw a BEM map up here to uh, to show the White Salmon Basin with um, Mount Adams up at the headwaters on the upper portion and Underwood, which uh, Adrian just talked about, that restoration site at the confluence with the Columbia River down at the bottom there. Um, in red, you can see where the former Condit Dam site was at River Mile 3.3. And the restoration project that I'll be talking about with you now is uh, up above that at the head of the former reservoir behind Condit Dam at about River Mile 5. Next slide, please. So I'll just give you a brief overview of where this uh, project connects with the overall Condit Dam decommissioning, the goals and performance standards that we had to adhere to as part of that overall decommissioning, um, as well as the goals for our particular project, some of the site conditions and challenges we faced, um, what we did, and what we learned. Next, please. 
So uh, the Yakima Nation was a settlement party to the decommissioning agreement for Condit Dam. And we had pushed very hard for years to uh, have the dam owner, Pacific Corps, consider removal rather than just providing fish passage so that we could see the river restored in its fluvial processes and not just um, allowing fish to, to move back and forth. We had agreed to try to help uh, Pacific Corps with some of the cost overrun of the decommissioning um, over what they had planned on. And we initially thought just to pass some funding through, but we found an opportunity and seized it to do something a little different, essentially a restoration within a restoration. And just a reminder, this is uh, private land as opposed to the big Elwha dam removal, which was on um, national lands. Next, please. So uh, Pacific Corps, as the dam owner, was required to revegetate the reservoir after they had breached and removed uh, Condit Dam and basically revegetate the whole area that had been affected by the dam in the reservoir. And what was accessible was about 60 acres of 92 overall acres. Um, and our objectives with our project had to square with their uh, their performance measures of 150 live trees per acre, 80% native herbaceous cover, and uh, riparian edge cover of 75%. So this was all laid out in their revegetation and wetlands management plan. We um, hammered out an agreement with uh, Pacific Corps over the course of about a year. This would be one of those long lead items that Brad was talking about yesterday. A uh, little longer than expected, and we continue to consult with Pacific Corps' revegetation team throughout our project. Next, please. Uh, so we were able to secure a whole watershed restoration initiative grant, which is um, through Ecotrust and NOAA. And uh, so we took the opportunity to fund, design, and implement a project on about 2.8 acres of that overall 60-acre footprint of the former reservoir. Um, we did this through an agreement with Pacific Corps and in partnership with Mid-Columbia Fisheries Enhancement Group. And Katrina Strathman, who you heard from yesterday, was the mastermind behind this and the restoration ecologist who came up with the planting design and um, work very hard on this project. So one of the, the features that we really were um, interested in was making sure that the community would be part of this project. This dam removal was very divisive within the community for many years. And um, one of the key stakeholders, the, the community surrounding this area felt um, a bit left out of the project. Um, of the overall dam decommissioning and planning. And so we felt that it was very important to promote ongoing stewardship, not just of the restoration project that we were working on, but of the overall um, decommissioning and, and subsequent restoration by involving the public. So the site that we chose was right adjacent to a public park and, um, and a boat launch. So it was a very gentle topography and safe for volunteers to help us with. Um, the goals were to establish herbaceous vegetation on some of these exposed soils that had been underwater for a century, um, establishing woody shrubs and trees, as well as herbaceous vegetation for fish and wildlife habitat. We were very interested in reintroducing tribally culturally important plant species, and as I mentioned, having volunteers from schools and community organizations helping helping us in the process. The idea was to essentially jumpstart succession. Next, please. So uh, we knew that we would be dealing with some unprecedented site conditions and that there was uh, pretty much a lack of institutional knowledge on which to draw about post-dam removal restoration best practices. Um, we looked to the Powerdale Dam removal across the way in Hood River on the Hood River that had happened just before that. And we also consulted with um, the 
vegetation technical staff on the Elwha uh, restoration to get some ideas. And from the Elwha restoration plan, we we learned that um, the disturbance after you know, 100 years of the dam being in place and the reservoir being there would expose landscapes that would be devoid of vegetation and covered in inorganic sediments that had accumulated over those 100 years, and that the circumstances would be much closer to primary succession with no biological legacies. So something more like the aftermath of a volcanic eruption or glacial retreat than wind throw or wildfire, and that some of those critical processes would have been interrupted, like nutrient cycling, soil building, and so on. So um, we knew that this was going to be a, a very raw site to deal with, and we would have some challenges ahead of us. Next, please. Those was what we had to plant into. So. Um, as I mentioned, the, the quote unquote soils were basically um, at the head of, a, of the reservoir. So the sediments that were coarser and larger had dropped out at, at this end of the reservoir. The finer stuff had drifted downstream. Um, the, uh, I think Adrian showed one picture of an excavator pushing sediments into the river. That happened on most of the rest of the accessible part of those 60 acres of the reservoir footprint. However, on our site, um, the contractors had left accumulated sediment deposits about 10 to 20 feet deep. And uh, this was obviously a, not an ideal situation and extremely hostile to getting plants to grow. And we were actually able to um, go to some reference sites and make the case to the landowner to Pacific Corps that they really should try and remove the sediments on the site down to as close to the native soils as possible to give us the best um, best possible chance for, for attaining those performance measures. Next, please. So uh, we had fairly sterile, coarse-brained, and well-drained material to work with. We sent some soils off to the lab. Um, Katrina consulted with a number of soil and other restoration experts um, to see what we should do once we got the results back, uh, which showed that we had a very acidic soil, high in iron and sulfur, that was at the same time very low in microbial activity and organic matter. So very challenging to get plants started in that. Um, I should mention that in the fall of 2012, Pacific Corps contractors had hydro seeded the entire reservoir area with a cover crop that included some native bunch grasses, um, a sickle keel lupin, and yarrow to help um, prevent erosion and add nitrogen to the soil. And that was sort of the, the substrate that we planted into. Next, please. So essentially, we took the opportunity to plant a little bit more diverse range of plants, but we had to essentially choose pioneer species, so hardy, hardy species that would be able to um, get a foothold in, in this harsh site. Um, we overplanted pretty heavily. As you can see, we planted 7,400 native plants, 34 species, and some of those were also forbs. Um, that was a pretty high density for a small site, but we had to account for the fact that we would not be able to irrigate and uh, that it, the site was very exposed and exposed to wind and uh, and the issues that we already mentioned about the soil. So we had to account for high mortality. We had, uh, we tried to also ensure that the uh, genetic material was adapted to the site as much as possible, so we collected and had grown out by native plant nurseries a lot of um, local seed propagules and cuttings from around the local site. That also meant that we worked with, uh, I believe it was six different nurseries, so it was a lot of managing plant materials. Next, please. The site is divided up into different planting zones based on the species ecological requirements, um, the access to the water table, and the proximity to both the existing vegetation edge 
and River. Um, there were also some Ford plots included. Um, and we decided to put in a footpath that would both allow the public to um, traverse the site to see it evolve over time and it also provided an opportunity for us to avoid trampling to be able to use that uh, footpath for uh, the arrows and that type of thing. Next please. So essentially we were not allowed to use gas powered equipment on the site so we used hand crews and hand dug planting holes and fairly cobbly material. Here's a WCC crew that did the initial planting. Um, we used wood chip mulch to hold moisture, suppress competition around the plants and start adding some organics to that soil. Um, and we added uh, herbivory protection to most of the trees and shrubs. Next please. We also had to amend the, the substrate that we were planting into. So we uh, had hand spread dolomite across the site to try and raise the pH. We added native forest soil and an ectomycorrhizal fungus to some of the planting holes for the trees to try and uh, improve the substrate that we were planting them into. Um, we also discovered that the lupin that had been part of the hydroseed mix came up in spades and um, in fact was out competing possibly some of our planting. So we actually took the took advantage of that and pulled some of these um, this large flush of lupin and used it as green mulch around some of our plants. Next please. So we designed the project and monitoring to uh, gain information on some of the methods we used and to trigger management response, to be able to adapt to the, the unknown conditions on site. Um, and also to evaluate the change in herbaceous shrub and tree cover over time, knowing that we needed to um, reach these performance measures that Pacific Corps had set out for them for their decommissioning. Um, we tried to design the monitoring to be simple and good and fast and could be used with um, volunteers, volunteers and community members. Um, and we were essentially looking at herbaceous shrub and tree cover along random transects, which you can see outlined by some of those green lines. Um, those were randomly selected each time. Uh, the survival of species in survival plots, which you can see in those green polygons and uh, permanent photo monitoring points, which are those yellow dots around the side. We hope to, in the future, be able to do long-term monitoring with, um, with unmanned aerial vehicles if possible. Next, please. So some of the challenges I already mentioned about the site conditions, but also um, timing challenges working with so many different nurseries and getting their root plants after um, the ground had already frozen. We also had issues with uh, the, the soil um, becoming uh, saturated and then freezing. So we had tube protectors that blew down. We had plants that were frost heaved, some of which we tried to replant. Um, we definitely had herbivory on the site. We had some some interesting weed uh, issues pop up, like a pretty broad, widespread um, Ventonata dubia infestation, which um, we're hoping that the other plants will outcompete over time, but that may have been a contaminant in the hydroseed mix. We're not sure. Um, and also because it's a public site, uh, we've had you know, lots of human use as well as domestic animals. So horseback riders and trespass cattle and you name it, lots of dogs. Um, land uh, access and management constraints, constraints were definitely something that we, we had to look around. Um, and the fact that this was a grant that paid for this project um, that has since expired. We are hoping to be able to continue to sort of cobble together resources to, to monitor and adaptively manage the site, but we also don't know what the future land ownership will be of this site. Um, Pacific Corps is planning to divest themselves of their lands, and so whether the site remains in the public domain or not is unsure. Okay, next please. 
So lessons learned, um, lots of them. <laughs> we, uh, we researched analogs and reference sites to get an idea of how to deal with, um, with these sort of unprecedented conditions. We sought technical expertise wherever possible. We used um, local plant materials as much as possible and good, trustworthy native plant nurseries that did a great job growing plants out for us. Uh, we had an adaptive approach. We monitored our survival and um, replanted in places as necessary. We engaged with the public a lot. We had somewhere over 500 uh, volunteers that have helped out on the site, both individuals and organizations. Um, we've been eager to share knowledge gained as much as possible. We've also learned that in a site with primary succession, you must be patient. And um, irrigation, we had one season we were able to eke out hand watering, and it, I believe it really helped. So where possible, irrigate. Next, please. So just wanted to end on a cute kid. Um, we're hoping that in the future this site will continue to evolve and fill in and um, will provide a, a living classroom with an interpretive trail for the community and for visitors and for people like this little future steward of the White Salmon River. Thanks. Thank you very much. I've been curious about uh, what has happened to this site, so I'm really really appreciative of all of the work that you've done and and that you've uh, given this presentation today. So anyone any questions? There was a question about the, um, the goldenrod on the initial project, um, whether you had any additional unexpected benefits from that? Well, we really think it outcompeted potential weeds that might have washed in and been able to take advantage. Um, uh, it provided abundant pollinator habitat. It allowed the woody species cover for browse while they could get established, and, and we've observed them just catapulting past the maximum height of the goldenrod in the last year with a couple of years of root establishment without browse. Anything else, Jeanette? I imagine it probably would have helped with um, with erosion as well, just because of the biomass and a lot of roots on the ground. And it was pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Um, were you able to irrigate via a water right, or was there any usable water source on either site, or did you have to take water in? Go ahead. So on the, on the upper side, on the reservoir, we did not have the option for a water right, um, I'm sorry, for irrigation until several years in, we were able to get temporary irrigation water right, um, and we had to rig up a system where the the pump was actually off-site and hoses onto the site and hand-watered every single plant um, because of the, the motorized um, restriction. So that was just one, one season uh, we were able to do that, but otherwise it was unirrigated on the, the reservoir site. And at the under I believe it came from the well uh, that is used by the village site. The lower, the lower one did. Yeah. That was another reason to commission it because that was not very popular. Limited water. Yeah, I had a, I had a question about the lower site. Um, I, I see that there's a community right there uh, next to the site. Were, were they uh, involved in the project? Uh, what, how did communication go with them? Yeah, uh, frequent communication. It is uh, still used, currently used for exercising tribal treaty fishing rights, and uh, there is some fish cleaning that occurs there, um, boat maintenance. Um, people do live there, and so they were 
contacted and informed and involved it, to some degree. It's a little bit transient uh, as far as who's always there um, or ha has been in the past. Um, but communication and, and um, preparation for any time work was being done or people were coming on site to do plant maintenance was always attempted at the least. Um, any other thoughts, Jeanette? I, I think you pretty much covered it. Um, Chief Johnny Jackson, who just passed away recently, he um, was very interested in what was going on out there and we, we kept him informed um, every time we were there and, uh, and they were notified before we went out. He actually um, made some requests for certain species of shrubs that he wanted to see out there. So we're going to um, make sure that we honor his wishes. Uh, we'll just take one last question. Uh, why no motorized equipment? On the reservoir site, that was a that was a restriction um, that Pacific Corps had on their lands, and I believe uh, it had to do with their. Um, I'm not sure if it was a risk issue or if it was a uh, fear of contamination issue with um, with gas powered um, motors. I'm not exactly sure what it was. They had to. I uh, conform to FERC and Department of Ecology regulations, so it may have been something along those lines just to, to avoid uh, contamination. But they are also very, um, very concerned about risk, so we had to um, come up with a, a pretty elaborate volunteer um, agreement as well to allow us to have volunteers out on the site, and Mid-Columbia Fisheries was able to um, to kind of work that through their uh, through their insurance coverage because that was that was also kind of complicated. So it was one of the one of the, the complicating factors I would say of, of working with a, a private landowner.